Today we're looking at Genesis 5. Now this is a chapter with genealogies in it. You may come to chapters with genealogy and go, oh, how boring, but there is so much in here that's exciting. And, and if you look deeper, oh, God has so much for us in it. So let's look at verse 1 and 2. This is the book of generations of Adam. When God created man, he created him in the likeness of man. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them, and named them man when they were created. So we, this is a look back at what had already ha happened in chapter 1, um, but no, there was no man to witness it. So it had to be related to Adam, and then passed down through generations to Moses. The history ends at Genesis 2-3, and from that point, Adam is able to um, give an eyewitness account. So in this chapter, we're getting the line that flows from Adam to Jesus. Obviously, there's lots of other lines, but this is the line to be preserved. The promise comes through this line. Notice it says, and he named them man. God gave them that name. Um, in fact, in some versions say, and God named them Adam. Adam is another name for man. It's not sexist or gender-based to call the human race mankind. God did it first. So, again, this is a, a chapter of genealogies. Some scholars say the genealogies aren't complete. Um, and it's the same with other genealogies in here, that some generations are skipped over. Even if we take that into account, um, the time from Adam to Jesus is at least four to 5,000 years. If there's a lot of omissions, 10,000 years. It, either way, it's a long time before Jesus comes. They wait a long time for that promise. So of course this puts the biblical account at odds with the world account, which says the world is millions and millions of years old. But perhaps God created the earth as an old earth with age built into it. When he created Adam, he was a full grown man. He didn't create him as a baby and have him grow. So could be the same way with the, with the earth. And what about those extremely long time life spans? We're going to talk about that more a little later. So during this time, the world was populating really quickly. Um, one writer estimated that Adam, um, if, he, if during his lifetime he only saw half the children he could have fathered grow up, and if only half of those got married, and if only half of those who got married had children, then even at a conservative rate, Adam would have seen more than a million of his own descendants. By the time of the flood, there could have been a billion people on the earth. Verse 3 through 5 says, When Adam lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness. After his image, and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Seth is the beginning of a godly line. Yeah, there's lots of problems in it, yet the Messiah still comes from it. Even as Seth was Adam's fallen image and likeness, so are we. We're all sons and daughters of Adam. We're born fallen as Adam fell. It would be redundant to say that every person born in Adam's, in, in Adam's image and likeness is fallen, but we are, except Jesus. So Adam had other sons and daughters, and but they're not specifically named. 
So these long lifespans, and we're gonna see a lot more. Um, some say the figures are figurative. Some say they that they calculated years differently, that they were even, even meant months. But that means that um, Enoch would have had Methuselah when he was five and a half years old. So no, that doesn't work. Some say that each name really represents a tribe and it's the lives of all the leader, leading members added together that add up to that number. That doesn't make sense. Someone even said that the early Jewish fathers added an outrageous number of years because all the heathen nations gave their heroes and their demigods lots of years and, and the Jews wanted to keep up. Not likely. None of those really make sense. It's what, it's the way God had it. It kind of goes back to the canopy theory that there was no rain, no water, no, um, no rain, no snow, none of that on the earth. There, that there was a canopy around the earth of water and it created a greenhouse effect. It also blocked harmful sun rays. So if we could live in a perfect body without damage from the sun, perhaps we would live that long. So now we're gonna get into the individuals and their years. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enish. Seth lived after he fathered Enish 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Seth were 900, 912 years and he died. When Enish had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enish lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enish were 905 years, and he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahal Mahalalel. Kenan lived after he fathered Mahalalel 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. And Mahalalel had lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahalalel lived after he fathered Jared 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. When Enoch had li lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. He, he was a young man. Enoch walked with God and he was not. For God took him. When Methuselah had lived eight, 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. We don't get any extra information about any of these men. They lived, they had kids, they died. Except Enoch. He stood out. He was carried away by God in a miraculous way. He didn't die. He walked with God. He had such a true relationship with God. Walking with God means he walked by faith. He walked in the light. He walked in agreement with God. It, after walking like this with God, it's like one day God says, you don't need to walk home. Why don't you just come home with me? We don't know how God took him. We don't know if he took him in a visible manner. We know later God is going to take Elijah in a visible manner, but we don't know how he took Enish, Enoch. And it seems like he began to walk with God in a special way after the birth of Methuselah. The name Methuselah means, when he is dead, it shall come. So it seems like after the birth of Methuselah, Enoch had a, had a special awareness of, from God that judgment was coming. 
and that got him into a special relationship with God. Now Methuselah lived 969 years. He is the oldest man recorded, and it wasn't an accident. It was by the grace of God. When Methuselah died, the flood came. In fact, the Midrash, the um, extra things that the rabbis added much, much later, says that the flood came on the day that Methuselah died. God kept him around longer than anybody, perhaps to give people a message to repent. In the sign we see a Lamech, we saw one in Cain's line. Um, in Cain's line, Lamech was boastful. In this one, he seems hopeful of the mercy of God. Verse 28 through 32 say, When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, it doesn't mean they were triplets. It means they were born to Noah in his 500s. Um, the overwhelming emphasis in here is that every one of these men died. They were under sin, except Enoch. And they were subject to death. Some of them probably all of them were great men, but none of them were the deliverer. An interesting thing about the names and their meaning. Let me give you the name and their meaning, and then I'm going to read it as the sentence. Adam is man, Seth appointed, Enish for mortal, Canaan sorrow. Mahalalel, the blessed God. Jared shall come down. Enoch, teaching. Methuselah, his death shall bring. Lamech, the despairing. Noah, comfort and rest. If you read those out of sense, it is. And I have to add a couple connecting words. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching. His death shall bring the despairing comfort rest. Was there an accident in those names? Obviously not. God has a message for us. Notice how old Adam is, 500 years before he had kids. That's pretty old. And if you go through and you and you chart out who who lived and when they died and when grandchildren were born and things like that. Noah could have spoken with Adam's grandson Enish. Since Adam and Eve had sons and daughters after Cain, Abel, and Seth, it's possible that Noah spoke with one of them because they lived so long. He barely missed talking with Adam. God has a message for us. He has a redeemer that he's bringing. I'm going to go ahead and do chapter 6 since chapter 5 was kind of short. Um, and we're going to get into the story of Noah here. Verse 1 and 2 says, When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Um, during this time of rapid population and long lifespans, there was a problem with ungodly marriage between the sons of God and the daughters of man. It's, although it's the first mention of daughters, it doesn't mean they were the first daughters. It just means... 
humankind was expanding. So who are these sons, sons of God? We don't get an explanation. So there's thoughts, there's theories. One is that the sons of God were from the line of Seth and the daughters were from the line of Cain. And this represents a intermarriage between the godly and the ungodly as something God does not want. Um, another idea is that this referred to kings who claimed the right to the first night with other men's wives on their wedding night. Um, if you ever watched Braveheart, we see that in there. Um, a king had a right to say, go to anyone's wedding and say, I get to sleep with the bride before you do. What an odd, ungodly thing. Um, for both of these, would it have made God angry enough to wipe out the, oh, almost the entire Earth's population? Was there something unusual about their children? Another idea is that they were either demons or demon-possessed men, and the daughters were men of human, women. Um, everywhere else, the phrase Son of God clearly refers to angels. Jude 6 tells us of the angels who didn't keep their proper domain but left their own habitation and were sexually immoral. Rabbis in the early church believed the angel theory. Um, so I, this is one of those where God is not clear. So um, it's the only time anything like this is mentioned in the Bible. So don't base a whole theology on this. Um, one important thing about the Bible is the Bible interprets the Bible and when there is something important, it will be backed up. This is the only mention of that. So don't spend too much time on that. Why did Satan, if it was Satan sending his demons, why did he send, send his demons to intermarry with human women? If he did, it was to, to pollute the genetic, genetic pool of mankind so that um, it would be less likely that the Messiah could come. Now, Satan knows God's, God said he's going to bring a Messiah, so, but Satan doesn't have a clue as to the plan of how. So he's doing everything he can think of to, to try to thwart God. Like, good luck. Um, the Savior couldn't be born of a demon-possessed mother. Um, and did he almost succeed? The race was so polluted that God found it necessary to start again with Noah and his sons and to imprison the demons so they could never do that again. Um, verses 3 and 4 say, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His day shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men of old, the men of renown. So again, don't base a whole theology on Nephilim. They're mentioned here. God cannot allow the human race to stay in rebellion forever. He did something about it then. There's a point of no return for God. There's a point where he will say no more. Are we reaching that point? Um, 120 years. Is it the lifespan of God, of men he's talking about? Or is it that the flood is going to happen in 120 years after this announcement? Don't know. Okay, so these Nephilim or the mighty men or the giants or the fallen ones, it mean, the Hebrew word means an especially powered person, animal or thing. Nim, Nimrod in Genesis 10, they use the same word about him. Um, they use the same word about tyrants in Psalm 52 and in Ezekiel 32, 27. And they use the same word about angels in Psalm 103, 20. 
Men of renown literally means men of the name. Maybe they were unique because they had a, a de demonic element in their parentage. Martin Luther says it meant that they were powerful kings of the Cain's line who had large harems. J. Wash Watts says that they were Noah and his family because they were separate from Cain's line and Seth's line who were intermarrying. They were the sons of the one true God that kept themselves pure. Don't know again. Verse 5 through 7 say the, says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the earth, and animals, and creeping things, and birds of the heaven, for I am sorry I have made them. No aspect of man was not corrupt. Man was completely corrupted. Matthew 24, 37, Jesus said, As the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Who are we? In the day, last days of Noah? The conditions of the world before the coming of Jesus is going to be like the conditions of the world before the flood. We're going to have an exploding population, sexual perversion, demonic activity, consistent evil in the heart of men, widespread corruption and violence. Are there any of those that we don't see? Now, was God really regretting? Was he sorry? What it really means is the Lord heaved with a sigh. He looked at the world and went, <sighs> it's striking that he does that. It, it doesn't mean that creation was out of control. It doesn't mean God hoped for something better and wasn't able to achieve it. God knew all along how things were gonna turn out. It, he had his plan. But when God sees what's happening, how men have taken their free choice, even though he knows it's going to happen, it affects him. God is not unfeeling in the face of our, our sin and our rebellion. When it says lot, that means to annihilate. The animals will suffer because of man. Animals have suffered forever because of man, but not to this degree. Verse 8 says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Well, God looked and saw corruption and pollution and, and, and needing to cleanse the entire earth. He found one man to begin again with. Noah. Your vision may say he found grace instead of favor. It's the first use of, of that word in the Bible. Noah didn't earn that grace. You found it. No one earns grace, but we all can find it. In the eyes of the Lord is another, is an example of what's called an anthropomorphic phrase. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God is the spirit. He doesn't have physical eyes. But to help us understand him, the Bible writers frequently give him human um, physical characteristics. Verse 9 and 10. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his gen generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. This is a description that's unique to Noah. It not only refers to his righteous life, but the fact that he was uncorrupted by Satan. Um, 
we could translate it to say blameless among the people of his time because he of course was born of sin so he was not completely blameless but we, he did not fall for Satan's schemes did he live a perfect life of course not there had to be flaws he had kids so he had these three kids, and they're going to fig figure into this in a major way. God's going to use them as the foundation for the rest of the human race. Is it possible Noah had other kids? It wasn't common to just have three kids. But if he did have more kids, perhaps they weren't righteous. Perhaps they left home to join the world. Again, we don't know. Verse 12 through, I mean, sorry, 11 through 13 say, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. It's not the world God intended it to be. Our world today is not as God intended it to be. What God intended was the Garden of Eden. Because of the corruption and the violence on the earth and, and the extent of the corruption, God told Noah he was going to judge the wicked of the earth, which was everybody but Noah and his family. In other cultures, mythology, humans were created to do the work of the gods so that the gods could lay around. However, they were bugged by these humans. They, they were like little ants and complaining all the time. So um, in a lot of these culture, cultural mythologies, the gods planned to get rid of them, and often by a flood. So, is this judgment too harsh? Does it show God to be a cruel monster? There are going to be children, puppies, little cute dolphins. Well, I don't know about secret children. But little cute animals and little cute babies and little children, they're all gonna be, all gonna be killed. Is God being cruel here? Ever since Genesis 3, every human has a death sentence. The timing of that is in the hands of God. God told Noah all this with the intention of saving Noah and his family. Notice he didn't say in these verses, and you're exempt. He's telling them everybody's going to die. So as Noah's thinking, oh, I guess... We're going to die too. Um, but in the midst of corruption and judgment, there's also grace. Instead of wiping out the entire human race, God preserved a remnant. So now he gives some instructions. 14 through 16 says, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark... 300 cubits, its breadth 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with a lower, second, and third decks. God tells Noah, make yourself. That means this is Noah's project. God, of course, could just materialize the ark. But he tells, tells Noah, you make it. The word ark means chest or box. Um, the only other time we're going to see that word, the Hebrew word, is when it talks about the basket in which Moses was placed into the river. So a cubit is about the distance between an average man's longest finger and his elbow. So it could differ a little, but it was usually about 18 inches. 
There's other measurements that use parts of the body. A span is a width from an outstretched thumb to the little finger. That's a span. And a hand breadth is the distance between all four fingers of a closed hand. The arc was about as long as a 30-store building is high. So it's about 450 feet, um, about one and a half football fields long. And it was about 75 feet tall, which is about four stories high. And it was, um, oh, I'm sorry, 45 feet wide, uh, 70, sorry, 75 feet wide, which is about um, four stories. And then it was 45 feet high. We see it had three stories. It had 100,000 square feet of deck space and 100 million cubic feet of storage. It was big. Apparently, the Ark experience in Kentucky was built to these measures. It'd be interesting to go see that. So go for work. What? We're not sure what that is. Most theologians think it refers to Cyprus because after that, most ships were built of Cyprus. The pitch was some kind of petroleum-based dark material. Um, the same material is used when Moses' mother waterproofed the basket for Moses. It was used by the builders of the Tower of Babel to hold the bricks together. It's probably what God used to set Sodom and Gomorrah on fire. So something interesting about pitch, it's normally applied to the outside of a boat to prevent leaking, but not inside. God tells him to put it inside. Also, that helped preserve the ark. We see all sorts of stories about people actually finding it, but how, will someone really, really find the ark? because that pitch would have helped preserve it. It's not really a boat. It's more like a barge. It, it's meant to float. It's not meant to sail anywhere. After all, it, it's a big chest. It's a shoebox shape. It was about the size of the Titanic, they figured. It had a cubic, cubit wide opening, 18 inches all around the top. That would have provided light and ventilation. You can imagine, they needed a lot of ventilation. So if the ark carried two of every family of animals, there were probably about 700 pairs of animals. But if it carried two of every species of animal, well, if it carried two of every family of animals, like dogs, cats, that, but if carried two of every species, like lions and tigers and um, leopards, three different kind, three different families, or three different species in one family, then there were probably about 35,000 pairs of animals. The average size of a land animal, the average size was a sheep. A, an ark this size could carry 136,560 sheep in half of its capacity. Still leaving plenty of room for people, food, water, whatever other provisions were needed. Some say that these animals were juvenile, were young, so they'd fit in better. Others say the animals were in hibernation. We don't get those details. God doesn't think we need to know that. Outside of the Bible, there is so much evidence for the reality of Noah's Ark. In 275 BC, Berossus, a, a Babylonian historian, wrote, but of this shop that grounded in, I'm sorry, of this ship that grounded in Armenia, some part still remains in the mountain, and some get pitched from the ship by scraping it off. Around 75 AD, Josephus, a Jewish historian, said the locals collected relics from the Ark and showed them off to this very day. He also said all the ancient historians knew he knew of wrote about the Ark. 
In 8080, Theophilus of Antioch wrote, the remains of the ark are to this day to be seen in the mountains. An elderly Armenian man in America said that as a boy, he visited the ark with his father and, and three scientists in 1856. Their goal was to disprove the ark's existence, but they found it and they became so enraged that they tried to destroy it, but they couldn't because it was too big and it had petrified. In 1918, one of the scientists, an Englishman, admitted on his deathbed the whole story was true. In 1876, a distinguished British statesman and author, Viscount James Bryce, climbed Ararat and reported finding a four foot long piece of hand tooled lumber at an altitude of more than 13,000 feet. Six Turkish soldiers claimed to see the Ark in 1916. In the early 1900s, a Russian aviator named Vladimir Rokovitsky discovered the, he said he discovered the Ark. He was stationed in southern Russia near the Turkish border in Mount Ararat. As he tested a plane, he and his co-pilot flew over Ararat and discovered on the edge of a glacier what he described as a boat the size of a battleship. He said it was partially submerged in a lake, and he could see there was an opening for a door nearly 20 feet square, but the door was missing. He told his commanding officer and an expedition was dispatched to find it and photograph it. Um, the report was forwarded to the Tsar, who was soon overthrown, and no one knows what happened to the report. In 1936, a young British archaeologist named Hardwick Knight hiked across Ararat and discovered interlocking hand-tooled timbers at the height of 14,000 feet. During World War II, pilots saw and photographed something they believed was on the Ark. That was the Ark of Ararat. Um, so there have been lots of attempts to find and document this Ark since, but now they're hindered by politics. The Turkish government will not allow people to come in. So this Ark was covered with pitch to waterproof the wood, and since, because of that, it, it is possible for it to have been preserved. It's possible God still has a purpose for the ark to remind us of past judgment, shortly before our future judgment. So because of the mention of pitch, which is a petroleum product, um, most people think that this happened in the Middle East. Um, and it's said that John D. Rockefeller looked for and found oil in that region based on this verse. Now, notice God hasn't told Noah why he's building an ark. All, know, all Noah knows at this point is that God will judge the earth and he's supposed to build this big old thing. Um, Noah doesn't know what God is up to. Even though he's given a staggering job, without knowing why, he does it. How often do we question God? Noah just did what he was told. <coughs> Verse 17 through 21 says, For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds, and the animals according to their kinds, and of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every short sort shall come into you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten, and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and them. So now Noah is getting the reason. We can only wonder what Noah felt at this moment. God called Noah to an essential 
role on the earth, the greatest salvation the earth had seen. Now, there's people that say, oh, the flood only happened in the Near East. But the word earth, well, sometimes the word earth is translated land in a local area. Um, these guys feel that there wasn't, couldn't have been enough water to cover the earth. But if there was that canopy of water around the earth and God just poked a hole, oh, that's, would explain it. But there is evidence of a worldwide flood. And God said he would destroy all flesh. If humans didn't spread outside the Near East, then a local flood would have done it. But it's not likely that they stayed put. Despite this coming judgment, God still makes a covenant with Noah. He and his family will be saved. This is the first use of the Hebrew word bereth for covenant. It's not going to be the last. There are mutual responsibilities, obligations, and promises on both sides in a covenant. Part of Noah's role in this covenant is to take pairs of animals, male and female, bring food. Um, the wording for you shall bring in Hebrew actually implies the animals will come to him. He doesn't have to go out and find them. But God has, but Noah has to position them in the ark. That's going to be quite a job. How the animals got along in the ark, that's a mystery. Imagine all the food he has to take. Verse 22 says, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Noah, according to Ezekiel 14, 14, Noah was an example of righteousness. He was a preacher of righteousness in Peter 2, 4. And in Hebrews 11, 7, Noah condemned the world by offering salvation in the ark that the whole world rejected. Even though he was a preacher of righteousness for what it seems to be about 120 years, no one was saved, but he was faithful to preach the message. The work of building the ark was hard, costly, tedious, dangerous, sometimes foolish, and ridiculous in the eyes of men especially when everything else around him is going on the same way year after year. Noah was probably the butt of so many jokes. So it's not strange that he is mentioned in Hebrews 11 in the chapter that's called the Hall of, Spain, Hall of Faith. Noah spent years before the flood in active obedience. He not only believed God would send this flood, he obeyed God and did what God told him to do to prepare. And he finished his yark. How do you think he feels? In Genesis 7, we'll find out more of the, of the flood and the ark.